Good morning again, dear friends. It's good to see you this morning. It's been a wonderful day of worship so far, and certainly am very thankful that we can be together as God's people to encourage each other and worship God in a way that pleases Him. As we continue in our two-part series today about the church, in this particular lesson, I want to talk with you I want to talk with you about a clear distinction. I want to talk with you about a clear distinction. Specifically, I want to talk with you about the clear distinction that the Bible makes concerning the actions of a local church and the actions of an individual Christian. I want to talk with you about the clear distinction that the Bible makes concerning the actions of a local church and the actions of an individual Christian. And the reason I want to talk with you about that is because this is something, unfortunately, that for so many people, even for so many Christians, they do not properly understand. Unfortunately, for so many people, they fail to properly understand the clear distinction that the Bible makes concerning the actions of an individual and the actions of a group, and i got to tell you that that is a puzzling, puzzling thing to me because usually we don't have a problem making this distinction when it comes to the things we talk about in our daily lives. For example, if I happened, and I would never do this in a million years, by the way, it's just a hypothetical situation, But if I happen to go out and rob someone for their money after church today, would it be accurate for someone to say that the whole Jeffries family did that? Would it be accurate to say that Gigi and Shawn Michael and Faith were also guilty of that? Would it be accurate for a newspaper article to read, Jeffries family robs Chandler resident? Would that be an accurate representation of what took place? You know it wouldn't. You know that even in our judicial system, there is an understanding that just because one particular member of a family is guilty of a crime, that doesn't mean that the whole family is guilty of the same crime. You understand this when it comes to to our American justice system, don't you, brothers and sisters? Well, we understand that. And we also understand this when it comes to sports. You know, when Larry Fitzgerald, and for those of you who may not know, Larry Fitzgerald is a wide receiver for the Arizona Cardinals. And when Larry Fitzgerald gets inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame one day, that doesn't mean that every team he's played on for the last 15 years will be inducted into the Hall of Fame as well. We understand that when it comes to sports, there is a distinction to be made between what one does as an individual from what one does as a team. We understand this when it comes to football. And we understand it when it comes to basketball and baseball and soccer. And you know where else we understand it? We also understand it when it comes to academics. Think about it. If Jared or one of the Amalon kids, or one of the Woolly kids gets a scholarship to NAU or AU, that doesn't mean that their parents or their grandparents got that scholarship also, does it? That doesn't mean that their grandparents or their parents are also going to get a free ride to AU or NAU. We understand that there is a distinction that needs to be made between what an individual child does compared to what a family does or compared to what a group does. We understand that, don't we, brothers and sisters? We see that, don't we? I'm I'm pretty sure you're intelligent enough to see that, right? In fact, I'm pretty sure that everybody here is intelligent enough to understand that. And if we can understand that when it comes to those everyday life examples, then we also should be able to understand it when it comes to this. We also should be able to understand it when it comes to the actions of a local church compared to the actions of an individual Christian. Again, unfortunately, for so many religious folks, they fail to understand 
that an individual Christian may do things independently from what a local church does. In other words, for so many people, they say, well, you know, well, since the church is made up of Christians, do that means that whatever the church does, the Christian does, and vice versa. You ever heard someone say that before? You ever heard a Christian say, well, you know what? I'm the church. I- I'm the church. Whenever I do something, that means the church did it also. You ever heard someone make that argument? Brothers and sisters, that argument is not well thought out. And it leads to some truly laughable consequences. It actually leads to some unauthorized things being done in the Lord's church. It actually leads to people making a mess of the will of Jesus for his church. That's the truth about the matter. And so now that we've laid our foundation this morning, By talking about what the church is and what the church is not, over the next few minutes, I want us to dig into this issue right here just a little deeper. This morning, I want to talk with you about the clear distinction that the Bible makes concerning the actions of a church and the actions of an individual Christian. I want to show you the numerous examples we have in the Bible where this distinction is clearly made by the Holy Spirit. And let's just begin with this right here. Let's just begin with the area of economics. In other words, let's begin with the area of money. Let's begin with the area of how one is to obtain money. You see, when it comes to an individual Christian, an individual Christian has a right from God to go out into the world and make money to take care of their family. An individual Christian can go into business and they can work and they can make a a profit. They can work for Southwest Airlines. They can work for Tom Campers. They can work for all kinds of, of different places as they choose, as long as that place is ethical and moral and does not violate the morality of the scripture, right? A Christian has a right to to go into business, work, and make a profit. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul. Do you remember when when the Apostle Paul was in the city of Corinth, in order to make some money to take care of himself, what did he do? Well, he he took up making tents, didn't he? he? He actually teamed up with a Christian couple, Priscilla and Aquila. The three of them went into the tent making business. As individual Christians, they went into business together and they made money. They had a right from God to do that. But I want you to understand the local church, according to the Bible, is to obtain money in a different fashion. While an individual may go into business and may go out and make money for a profit, the local church is to obtain money through a collection that is taken up by the people of God on the first day of the week. That's exactly what we did at 9.30 or 9.15 this morning. And I want to show you this from the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, a verse that many of us are very familiar with. But just because we're familiar with it don't, doesn't mean that we don't need to read it this morning like we're reading it for the first time. And so in 1 Corinthians 16 and in verse number 1, as the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he says, now concerning... The collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also on the first day of every week. Each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper. So that no collections be made when I come. Notice how here the Apostle Paul gives very specific instructions in regards to how a local church is to obtain money. Notice I hear Paul commands a local church to take up a collection on the first day of the week. Brothers and sisters, we have no authority from God to do it on any other day or in any other way. God says we obtain money in the church by taking up a collection on the first day of the week. Of the week. Now, this is important for us to understand because for so many churches today, even in so many churches of Christ, they are violating what the Lord clearly says here. You see, unfortunately, for so many churches, they're violating this principle by selling products 
and owning businesses and having car washes and basketball tournaments and bake sales. And the list goes on and on. And when trying to justify these practices, you know what some people say? Well, they say, well, since individuals make up the church, then that means that whatever the individuals may do, the church can do also. That is exactly what a lot of people say. And that is truly, truly ridiculous. I mean, think about this. If that is true, if it is true that there is no difference between what an individual Christian does compared to a local church, then that would mean that when the Apostle Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila went into the tent-making business, then the whole church in Corinth went into the tent-making bu- tent business as well. That would mean that the whole church in Corinth was involved in that enterprise. That is exactly the path that logic leads you down. But I hope we have enough sense to understand that that was indeed not the case. Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila as individuals were involved in the tent-making business, and the church in Corinth received their money by taking up a collection on the first day of the week. There is a clear distinction made between the actions of a group from the actions of an individual. Do you see that? The Bible makes that distinction in the area of economics. And it also makes that distinction in the area of family. You know, when it comes to individual Christians, an individual Christian has a right to get married. And they have a right to bear children with their spouse. And they also have a right or responsibility to care for their aged family. These are the things that an individual Christian must do in the area of family. But a local church, a local church has been given a different set of instructions in regards to this. And so go in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 16. We went through this verse a few weeks ago in our Bible class. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 16. I'm reading from the New American Standard Translation. And here the Apostle Paul says in verse 16, If any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them. And the church must not be what? The church must not be burdened. Some of your translations say the church must not be charged so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. Brothers and sisters, if this verse doesn't clearly show a distinction between the actions of a local church and the actions of an individual, if we can't see that from that verse, then guess what? We just don't want to see it. The Bible couldn't be any clearer than that. Notice how according to the Bible, The Holy Spirit clearly makes a distinction in an area where a Christian is to be, an individual Christian is to be involved in where the church cannot act. God says there is an area where the individual Christian is to be involved in when the church cannot act. Notice how Paul says that if a widow has a family who can take care of her when she's destitute, guess what God wants to happen? God wants that widow's family to step up to the plate and handle that responsibility. God wants that widow's family, her kids or her grandkids to step up and take care of her financially. Why? So that the church may not be burdened, so the church may not be charged, so the church can have its money freed up to help those widows who don't have a family to take care of them. Clearly, the Bible makes a distinction between the actions of a local church and the actions of an individual Christian. Do you see that? Or am I the only one this morning that can see that? Y'all looking at me crazy this morning. That's okay, because maybe you can see it here. Maybe you can also see it, hopefully, when it comes to the area of social activity. What about the area when it comes to food and fun and frolic? You see, when it comes to the individual Christian, individual Christians can plan, pay for, and provide social events for themselves and other people. Look, if I want to invite 50 members of this church to, to our house today to eat pizza and watch a ball game, and drink Coke Zero and just have a good time, guess what? I have a right to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. We find the disciples of Jesus doing that kind of stuff in the Gospels, and we also find the early church in the book of Acts doing those kinds of things. Christians need to get together and spend time together in in a social setting. 
as individual Christians, we have a right to plan and, and pay for and provide social events for ourselves and other people, but the local church has a different set of instructions when it comes to this. You see, when it comes to social activity, when it comes to social events and things of a recreational nature, God wants this realm or this work to be separate and apart from the work of his church. Someone says, well, where is that at in the Bible? Well, go into the book of 1 Corinthians. We go back to 1 Corinthians, and a lot of the answers to these questions are actually found in 1 Corinthians because there, if there was one church who had a lot of issues in the first century, it was this church. They struggled to get this stuff just like a lot of churches struggle to get it today. In fact, when it came to the church at Corinth, they seemed to have a problem understanding how God does make a distinction between what they could do as a group and what God allows them to do as individuals. Here in 1 Corinthians 11, unfortunately, we learn that when it came to the church at Corinth, one of the things that they were guilty of is they were, they were guilty of turning this meal right here into a common meal. They were guilty of turning it into a social feast. They had mixed up the work of an individual with the work of the church. And so listen to what Paul says in verse number 22 of 1 Corinthians 11. He says, what? I can almost imagine Paul's face when he's writing that. What? What in the world are these people doing? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those among you who had nothing? Notice you had not only were they perverting the Lord's Supper, but they were abusing and misusing the poor among them. He says, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? And in this, I will not praise you. With these words, Paul's expressing frustration. Because again, these Christians had mixed up the work of an individual and the work of the church. Again, there's nothing wrong with Christians getting together and having a good time. There's something wrong with Christians getting together to enjoy food and recreation and social activities. There's nothing wrong with Christians getting together to play basketball and go golfing together and go bowling and eat pizza and drink coffee and eat donuts. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. In fact, once again, we need to do those kinds of things as a family. There's nothing wrong with that. That's good and proper in the eyes of God if as individuals we engage in those things, but that is not what God wants us to do when it comes to our work as a church, whether it's spending his money, the Lord's money, or whether it's when we come together on the first day of the week for the purpose of worshiping God. Social work, recreational activities, that's not a work of the church. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying that you need to keep social feasts separate and apart from what you do when you come together as a church. And so, again, we find a clear distinction made between in the, in the area of social activity. But, but someone says this. Someone says, well, Sean, what, what about when it comes to helping the poor? What about when it comes to helping the needy? I mean, does the Bible also make a clear distinction when it comes to that? You better believe it does. You see, when it comes to individual Christians, as an individual Christian, Sean Jeffries can use the money he earns as a preacher to help whoever I want to help. I can help my parents. I can help needy brethren here and elsewhere. You know who else I can help? I can also help the man holding a sign up at the stoplight asking for money. I can use my money to help Christians and non-Christians as an individual disciple. I have a right to do that. In fact, I should do that. Look over in your Bible at Galatians. I want to show you a couple of places in the Bible. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 10. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 10. Here in the context, and I'm a big advocate of context, in the context, Paul's not talking to a church. He's talking to individual Christians. We know that because in verse number one of chapter six, he says that if you know of a brother called in any trespass, you as an individual have a responsibility to restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Paul is talking to individual disciples there. And then in verse 2, he says, bear one another's burdens. Again, talking to individual disciples, not a church. 
It's important to understand the context because then verse number 10 makes more sense when he says, so then while we as individuals have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Notice how as an individual Christian, I have a responsibility to do good to all people. I have a responsibility to help Christians and non-Christians with my resources. Here in this context, Paul is talking to the individual disciple, not a church. In fact, James does the same thing in James chapter 1. Go in your Bible to James chapter 1. And this is one of the most abused verses among our brethren over the last few decades. But let's see if we can get the right understanding of it this morning. James 1 in verse number 27. James says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself, (laughs) keep oneself unstained by the world. Here, James is not talking to a church. He's talking to individual disciples. He's talking to me. He's talking to you as the individual. He is saying that as individual disciples, we need to be genuine and authentic disciples. In fact, and we're going to be studying James over in a few weeks, but the whole book of James is written to individual Christians. It is admonitions given to individual disciples on how to be gentic and authentic and real disciples. This whole book is about how to practice undefiled religion as an individual Christian. James says that part of me, Sean Jeffries, being being the real deal as a disciple is I need to try to help the less fortunate. I need to help orphans. I need to help widows. In fact, if you don't believe that he's talking to individuals, look at verse 22 of the chapter. He says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely merely hearers who delude themselves. Again, James is talking to individual Christians. As an individual Christian, I can use my money to help whoever I want to help. But the local church's funds are limited. Specifically, they're limited to needy Christians. And I may need to go ahead and add needy faithful Christians. You find that when you read all throughout the New Testament and don't have don't worry about writing these verses down all right now because the outline is on the website. So they're all there for you. But you find it in Acts chapter four, Acts chapter five, Acts six, Acts 21, Romans 16, 2 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 16. It's all over the place. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1, Paul specifically calls the collection we take up on the first day of the week, the collection for the what? The collection for the saints. Not the collection for the world, not the collection for the man down the street. Holding the sign up is the collection for the saints. Needy Christians. There's a distinction the Bible makes in the area of helping the poor. Do you see that? Well, let me give you one more. And this one has to do with the area of restoring an erring brother or sister in Christ. Go over in your Bible back to what was read earlier in Matthew chapter 18. Brother Tom read Matthew 18, and let's reread it for the sake of emphasis. Matthew 18 and verse 15. Here Jesus says, Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins... We're dealing with, if I know of a brother or sister in sin, I need to go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the what? It's okay, you can say it. Tell it to the what? Tell it to the church. That's right. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Again, brothers and sisters, if we can't see the clear distinction the Bible makes here between the actions of an individual Christian and the actions of a church, then guess what? We just don't want to see it. It can't get any clearer than that. Notice how here Jesus is giving instructions in regards to to restoring a sinful brother and sister in Christ. 
Jesus says that when it comes to this specific area, while the church does have some responsibility, most of the responsibility actually falls on the individual. And so let's go through it very carefully. Notice how if I know of a brother or sister that's in sin, the first step that needs to be taken needs to be me, Sean Jeffries. I need to go to that brother or sister in private. And I need to sit down with them with the word of God, and I need to try to help them come back to God. I need to try to help them come back to the Lord. And if they repent, they come back to God. Guess what? We're done. We don't have to go any further. I have won my brother, Jesus said. The first step in the process is I need to go to the individual alone. But if after going to that person alone and they don't repent, what's the next step? Well, the next step is I need to go back again. Only this time I don't go back alone. This time I take Jason with me or I take Lance with me. We go together and we sit down with this person together and we try to urge them to repent. We try to urge them to come back to God. And guess what? If they repent, we're done. We don't have to go any further. But if they still don't repent, what's the next step? The next step is then the church gets involved. Then we tell it to the church and the church uses their hopefully persuasive methods to try to urge this brother or sister to come back to God. And after a period of time, that person still doesn't repent. What do we do then? Well, we let them be unto us as a heathen and as a tax, leather, a tax collector. In other words, we pull back or withdraw fellowship. This is the process that the Lord has given when it comes to what we refer to as church discipline. And I want you to think about this. If what the individual Christian does constitutes the church acting, then guess what? The church has been acting the whole time. The church has been involved in the process the whole time. And that means that Jesus, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know what he's talking about here. And I hope we can agree that that's not right. Again, there is a clear distinction to be made between the actions of a church and the actions of an individual. I'm trying to do my best to help us see that this morning. But. Someone may hear all this and they may say, okay, Sean, what's the big deal? (laughs) I mean, why did you spend the last 20 minutes talking about this? How in the world is this to help us? Why should this be relevant to my life as a Christian? Well, if you don't mind, very quickly, I want to give you four reasons, four reasons why a sermon like this is so important for us to talk about from time to time. First, I think it's important that we pause and make sure we understand this from time to time because understanding this issue will better help us understand who we are as Christians. It will help us better understand that no one person here this morning is the church. I'm not the church. You're not the church. Jace is not the church. Doug's not the church. Rick is not the church. No one person here is the church. Instead, we as individual members, we make up the church. That's what the Bible says. And someone says, show me that in the Bible. Well, I can show you that easily. I can show you that in 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 13, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse number 13, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of the one spirit. Verse 14, for the body. And remember earlier in our first lesson, we looked at how the body is the church. Jesus head of the one body, which is the church. The body is not one what? It's not one member, but many. Just like my hand doesn't constitute my whole body. Neither does Jason or Doug or Rick individually constitute the whole church. The church is not one member, but instead it's many members. We as individual members make up the body of Christ. And so understanding this issue helps us better understand who we are. We are individual members of the Lord's body. And understanding this issue also helps us better understand the true mission of the church. 
As I said earlier, when we fail to make a proper distinction between the actions of a church and the actions of an individual, you know what we can lead to, you know what we can wind up doing, what can lead us to, to doing? We can wind up making a mess of things. We can wind up making a mess of things in the church, and we can ultimately fail to respect the headship of Jesus in the church. Remember, we studied earlier Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22. Again, Jesus is the head of the church. Acts 20 verse 28 says that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. Brothers and sisters, I want us to understand this morning that when it comes to the church, when it comes to the universal church or whether we're talking about a local church like the Monte Vista church, it all belongs to Jesus. This is Jesus' church. It's not the elder's church. It's not deacon's church. It's not Sean Jeffrey's church. It's not your church. It's Jesus' church. He purchased the church with his blood, and he has some very specific things that he wants his church to be involved in. And so I'm going to show you some things, and don't worry about writing all this down right now. The outline is on the website, but here are some examples of what Jesus wants his church to be involved in. First, the Lord wants his church to be involved in worship. He wants his church to be doing what we are doing this morning. One of the purposes of the church is for the people of God to come together on the first day of the week and worship our Father in spirit and in truth. A work of the church is worshiping God. And a work of the church is also edifying one another. Someone says, well, what is edification? Well, I like to think of edification as the application of biblical truth into my life so I can become more like Christ. I like to think of edification as building up brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, that's what we've been doing today. A work of the church includes worship and it includes edification. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26, Paul says that in everything we do, it needs to be for edification. It needs to be for building each other up and becoming more like Christ. And a work of the church is also teaching the gospel. What I'm doing right now, what we did in our Bible classes, what we try to do every single week in this place, we teach the word of God. We proclaim the truth. That is a work of the church. We find the church doing that all throughout the book of Acts. And a work of the church is spiritual discipline holding each other accountable to the standards of God and correcting those disciples who engage in sin. And the work of the church includes equipping one another for spiritual service. And the work of the church includes using the Lord's money to support gospel preachers, whether they are in this location or in Africa or across the globe. In fact, this church has several preachers that they support in this country and around the world. And that is certainly an authorized work and the work of the church also includes helping needy, faithful Christians. As Brother Allen said this morning, when we sent money to the brethren in Africa, we were helping needy Christians who were destitute. This is the work of the church according to the scripture. And that's what we got to be about. That's what studying this issue helps us understand as the people of God. In fact, that leads us to a third thing that I think studying this and rehearsing this helps us better understand. And that is thoroughly rehearsing this also helps us understand that church membership. It doesn't take the place of our individual obligations to God. In other words, just because I'm a member here of this congregation. Just because I am part of a wonderful church that stands for the truth when it comes to worship, that doesn't mean that I don't have to do what John 4 and verse 24 says. Even though this church stands for the truth when it comes to worship, when I sit in that pew and I worship God, guess what? God is examining me as an individual. He's examining my heart. He's examining my passion. He's examining whether I am doing what he says when it comes to worship, I can't ride your coattail when it comes to worship that pleases God. I have my own individual obligation. Just because I'm a member here, that doesn't mean I don't, I don't have to worship in spirit and in truth. And that also doesn't mean that I don't have to do evangelism. 
Even though I may be at a church where they have a, a local preacher, a full-time preacher, that doesn't mean I don't have to do what Matthew 28 and verse 19 says. That doesn't mean that I don't have a responsibility to go out into the world and try to make disciples of the nations. That doesn't mean I don't have a responsibility to shine my light and try to bring other people to the king. Being part of a church and having a local preacher at the congregation that I'm a member at, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that I don't have an obligation when it comes to evangelism. And you know what else it doesn't mean? It also doesn't mean that I don't have to do Galatians 6 and verse 10 and James 1 and verse 27. It also doesn't mean that as an individual, I don't have a responsibility to do good to all people with my resources, especially my brothers and my sisters in Christ. It doesn't mean that I don't have a responsibility as an individual, not trying to use the church as a crutch, but as an individual, I need to visit orphans. I need to look after widows. I need to keep myself unstained from the world, as James says in that verse. In fact, if you look over at Matthew 25, and we don't have time to read all this right now, forgive me, but I want you to read it when you get home. In Matthew chapter 25, if you remember, beginning with verse 31 and going through the rest of that chapter, Jesus describes the judgment day. He says on the judgment day, he's going to come back. And when he comes back, all the nations are going to be gathered before him and he's going to separate them like a shepherd separates the sheep from the ghost. Do you remember that? Now, it is interesting how when Jesus paints that scene, when we stand before him, it is interesting how in this text, the questions that he asks are not questions like, well, did you come to church every single Sunday? Don't get me wrong. We need to come to church every single Sunday. And he doesn't ask, well, did you come to every single Bible class? Although we do need to come to every single Bible class. But that's not the questions he asked here. In Matthew 25, and beginning with verse 31, Jesus says on the judgment day, he's going to ask questions like, did you feed your brothers and sisters when they were hungry? Did you give them a drink when they were thirsty? Did you visit them when they were in prison? Did you let them in, their, in your home when they were destitute? Those are the kinds of questions that Jesus asked here in this judgment they've seen. And brothers and sisters here in this context, he's talking about when we stand before him as individuals. You see, when we stand before the Lord on the judgment day, although I wish I could, I'm not going to be able to stand with Jason. I'm not going to be able to stand with you. I'm not going to be able to stand with my wife or my kids. When I stand before the Lord on the judgment day, I'm not going to be standing with the Monta Vista Church of Christ. I'm going to be standing as Sean Jeffries, individual disciple. I'm going to be standing before my Lord as an individual. And on that day, he's going to want to know, did you do your part as an individual? Did you help the poor? Did you look after your brothers and sisters in Christ? Did you be a, were you a good steward of the things I blessed you with in your life? That's what the Lord's going to ask me as an individual disciple on the judgment day. And I need to be mindful of that. I need to understand that being a member of this church, that doesn't mean I don't have to do what these verses say about helping the poor as an individual. It's not going to be enough for me to stand before Jesus and say, well, Jesus, I put $100 in the collection plate every Sunday. That's not good enough. You had other responsibilities as a Christian and you failed. And then finally, being a member of a local church and understanding this issue is also important because I think it also reminds us of what the Lord wants to draw people unto him. If you remember, we talked earlier about how in so many churches today, they're trying to draw people to them in the wrong way. Have you noticed that? So many churches are trying to draw people to the Lord through gimmicks. Sports, pizza, playgrounds, Starbucks, donuts, child care services, sack races. Unfortunately, for so many religious folks, they fail to understand that he doesn't want those kinds of things to draw people unto him. Instead, he wants the gospel to draw people unto him. Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, Paul says we've been called not through gimmicks, but through the gospel. And then do you remember what, what Jesus says? I just want to show you one more thing, and then we're going to get ready to close. John chapter 6. John 6, you remember after Jesus 
miraculously fed those thousands of people with just a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. Remember the next day they were looking for him again, only they weren't looking for him because they wanted to follow him. They weren't looking for him because they wanted to make him the Lord of their lives. Instead, Jesus says in verse 26 of John 6, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, not because you were convinced of the evidence, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You want some free food. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. Jesus says, don't come to me because you want food, physical food. Come to me because you want spiritual food. Jesus says, I want the bread of life to draw people unto me. The question is, do we trust what Jesus wants? Do we respect what Jesus wants? Let me tell you something. If we really respect what Jesus wants, if we really believe that this church belongs to him, then we won't have any problem letting the individual be the individual. And letting the church be the church. If we draw people to Jesus through gimmicks, he's not going to be pleased. We're going to have to give an account for that on the day of judgment. And there's a lot more I could say about this this morning. But here's the take home. The take home is there is a distinction that needs to be made between what the church can do and what individual Christians can do. The church and the individual disciple are not the same thing. God wants us to keep those distinctions clear. That is absolutely critical to pleasing him as his people. And so thank you for listening so carefully this morning. If there's somebody here, who maybe you've been hearing these things and you're saying, you know, I hear you talking about the church this morning, but that's, I'm not part of that. I want to be part of that. I want to be part of the Lord's church. If that's your desire this morning, then I want you to know the Lord died so you can be part of his church. He wants you to be part of his spiritual family, and you can do that by doing the same thing that people did in the first century. Believing in him as the son of God, confessing him as the Lord, repenting of your sins and being immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. If you will do those things, the Lord will add you to the universal body of saved, and then you can then join yourself to this local church here and do God's work with us. And so if there's somebody here this morning who needs to respond to the gospel, we're going to sing a song. We're going to invite you to come right here right now. Let's stand. Let's sing.